this is going to be um, a wonderful session and it's sort of a continuation really from last year when um, we decided quite bravely, I think, to open up a conversation about relationships and actually hosted it, I think, in a breakout room and it was full. So when we were planning the schedule this year, this uh, session was a priority. So I'm delighted to uh, reintroduce you to Matt. Of course, you've met Diana Kimmel and Michael. Um, Matt is joined by Heather. It's their first time, I think, speaking together. So welcome, Heather. Um, Heather is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Tennessee. And she's worked in rural mental health, serving her hometown for over a decade, where she operates a small private practice. In addition to being the full-time manager of Project Sleep, Sleep's Sleep Helpline program. So you may recognize uh, Heather from her work that she started earlier this year with um, Project Sleep. She runs the, the phone line there. It's awesome. What I think is really wonderful is that Heather has... Um, a contact she was um, raised with a sister with narcolepsy and it's just one of those wonderful sweet moments in life when you see things go full circle and so she um, and Matt were married a couple of years ago I think now and it's been yes <laughs> it's been really wonderful to um, welcome Heather into the community anyway enough of me all right Michael here we go all right um, why don't I start us off by asking all of us um, maybe to think back about the last family trip that we were on and the challenges that we faced with our loved ones with a sleep disorder and how we navigated that. Yeah, you know, the, Heather and I were talking about this ahead of time. We don't like to travel a lot because of the challenges <laughs> that, that living with sleep disorders um, kind of brings to the table. Um, you know, we went and visited, you know, my cousin um, down in... Um, Outer Banks. And I think that was the last time we had a family trip. And, you know, it, it's a remarkable, every, every planning step that we have to take, you know, it, one piece that comes in mind is, you know, am I going to be able to take a nap? How are we going to get there? Um, you know, I can help out a little bit driving, but that burden is going to be shifted to Heather. Um, we finally have some kids that, that are driving age, which I would recommend that to everybody because it makes it so much easier. Um, but the reality is we do. We think a lot about sleep. How, you know, how is it going to work? You know, do we have everything that we need? Um, so it's, it's been a while. We, we, we try not to put ourselves in too many situations, but um, we also are really blessed to have family members that, that do understand, um, or at least that's the ones that we choose to surround ourselves with. Most of the time our travel is work-related, um, so it's a little less fun. But we do tend to plan events around sleepiness, um, so making sure we're not packing too many things into one trip um, and making sure that flights aren't too early or too late um, and kind of making sure we're scheduling things. That, that's a lesson that we're still working on, the not yes. putting too many things. I think yes. our mistake, and I'm sure some of you can relate, is we had we thought through plans for travel and with family. We had come up with an idea of how we could do one side of the family and seeing them. And then we got a surprise, hey, we're going to be on a road trip and we'll be near you the week before. And we'd love to stay with you. And um, that was hard. Um, navigating the back-to-back -back family vacations is not recommended <laughs> um but uh i think that that was a particular challenge to us and it, it it required a lot of communication with the other side of the family my side of the family to make sure that they understood we're not going to be able to do as much maybe um planning activities where um my brothers have uh three three kids under four um, and so choosing activities where they can go do stuff in the morning and then we're then ready by about noon, one o'clock, we do an activity with them, come back, and then they are free to do other activities and just planning a nice structured. Yeah. I'm going to go with, um, it could be a, a vacation with family or friends. It could be a holiday with family or friends. It could be just going out to a movie with family and friends. Mm -hmm. You always, you have a plan, 
but IH often decides what I'm going to do with that day. So I could talk about it. I could look at excursions. I could say I'll be there when we eat dinner on Christmas, but I always know there's that possibility it can't happen. Mm -hmm. And there's that always that possibility that my partner knows is not going to happen, mm -hmm. but I'm the one that feels it and knows it. So I've got the anxiety. I've got the, what's going to happen? Who's going to be very upset? Mm -hmm. Whose night am I going to totally ruin because we weren't there at that exact time? You know, with relationships, when people are counting on you to come through with what you said. And when somebody asks you to, you know, don't you want to go out? Sure, I do. Absolutely. It's not that I don't. And that's the hardest thing for me to really get across. It's not that I don't want to do it. It's not that I don't want to see you. It's not that I don't want to go to all those vacations with you. I just know that it's hard and I don't want to disappoint. Yeah. You know, when, just listening to both of you talk, uh, prioritization is such a key thing. So what's the most important activity that we have planned? Like, how do I make sure that I have enough spoons allocated to do that? I think is a, is a big thing. And um, listening to Michael talk um, to, uh, it reminded me of the most powerful word and complete sentence in the English language, which is no, period. Um, that's been something that Heather's been really good about helping me understand. You know, I don't have to say yes to everything. You know, there's certain things I'm going to have to say no to so I can say yes to what's most important so which is making sure that I'm prioritizing time with her that I'm prioritizing time with kids because if I if I end up saying yes then that means I have to say no to the most important people in my life and that's something admittedly I'm not great at but I'm, I'm certainly working to get yeah that. yeah and I'm sure that you you understand like the potential guilt that comes with mm -hmm. saying no All right. of course right of course, but you're not responsible for someone else's like re reaction. Well, not just the guilt of that. saying no, though, but the yeah. guilt of saying I, I almost got to the door and I just can't do it. Yes. I mean, yes. if in my daily life, if sometimes I want to go food shopping and I get enough energy to get to the parking lot where I've turned <laughs> around and gone home mm -hmm. because in the parking lot, I've decided I can't go further. That happens with holidays. That happens with, um, you know, events. And then also we talked about brain fog. Mm -hmm. I could forget, you know, mm -hmm. um, relationships within the home, mm -hmm. you know, we decided, we agreed, I'll take care of this. You'll take care of that. But I overthink and overthink and overthink. And it's the simplest thing, a very simple thing that my partner could have done and made a decision and executed that in two minutes. I, I put it off three days because I'm overthinking it, overthinking it. I'm afraid I'm going to fail at it. And you know, that's, that's difficult in a lot of ways. And family can make a big difference when they're understanding. Like, I think right. the thing that I really appreciate from saying my dad is anytime that my wife is sleepy, having trouble, um, he sees and he's like, you know, you know, you don't need to worry about anything. Do you want some coffee? I can bring you some coffee, but yeah. you don't need to worry about any, having any expectations from us as far as like, you don't, you don't have to be on for dinner. You can take a break. We can bring you food. You don't have to hang out with us and we're not offended. Like right. we're just going to do like, we're going to work on a puzzle instead. Yeah. For me. And I, I mentioned it before though, I, I had to take some onus too, because I tried to hide it. I tried to fake it. I tried to, mm -hmm. you know, act like it wasn't happening. And then I guess when I accepted my diagnosis and I really started to openly tell people I, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. It does help a little bit. You know, if I'm honest with these people of like, it, it may not happen. So start dinner without us if we can't make it. Um, sometimes it, it works, you know, but you know, sometimes it doesn't, but that's kind of on them. If I let them know and I'm honest and I was, you know, brave enough to say, this may not happen. Mm -hmm please do not be mad at me. And I think that goes back to the point Matt and I were discussing, which was setting expectations. Yeah. Um, so when we are discussing plans and we're trying to figure out what we're going to be doing, it's what things are important and what level of support does the other one need? Like yeah. kind of making sure that we're balancing those things out. Um, and so there are things that I go, mm, yeah, I'm gonna go to this by myself because you've had all of these things this week. Right. Um, and I may or may not go <laughs> by myself right. um but it, it keeps us out of resentment as right. well because we kind of manage those expectations ahead of time 
Now, if we're at that family event and I've got that look on my face. Oh, um, oh, oh, I've seen it. <laughs> and you've seen it. We've been to HF events and I'll get that look. And Michael's like, I'm getting you out of here now. Yes. It's um, time. And, and that does help as well. I highly recommend that. Um, I get this look, take the reins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we have got um, several yeah. <laughs> forms of nonverbal communication. Right. Um, it's the come and rescue me face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think stated up here with, you know, a partner who, who's very loving and supportive. I think that's, that's a key piece to it is surrounding yourself by people who empower you and are accepting and loving. Um, you know, you can't really necessarily choose your family of origin. You know, you're, you're born, born into that family. Sometimes you'll have to navigate that, but, you know, as someone who's has what I would uh, politely call an unsuccessful relationship prior to, to Heather and, and to have someone who's supportive now, I think is, is such a, a critical piece to that. And, you know, how do you find that supportive partner? I think it's such a tricky question for so many people in, in, the, in right. the community. Right. You know, when do you disclose whether or not, you know, you have a sleep disorder? How does, how does all that work? I mean, it's a, it's a scary landscape um, trying to navigate you know, online dating or dating in general without a sleep disorder and, and with one, I think is a even scarier piece. Right. Um, I have a support group in Atlanta. Michael and I um, often are there together. And we've had couples come in um, and the supporter is not really educated in mm -hmm. what's, what's going on with their person with idiopathic hypersomnia. And it also could be that the communication is down. Then you see the supporters talking to each other. And then they realize that what's going on with their loved one isn't like personality thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's again, like all of us are having it. It's an IH thing. It's a narcolepsy thing. And we figured out in a support group that most of us in that group that day of 12, the biggest challenge of each day is what do I want to eat? If I go to a restaurant, I don't even want to... They ask me like, what do you want to eat? I don't care. I don't care where we go. I don't care what we do. I don't even want to use the energy for that. But here my, <laughs> I hear a giggle. It's that, it's that much energy just to make those simple decisions. And all of a sudden now these supporters had that understanding. We're all doing it. Yeah, it was, it was pretty big. It was like, oh, okay. So when I'm in this situation, instead of what do you want to eat? It's, hey, would you like A or B? or just picking a dish that I know that my wife might like. And then if she doesn't like her dish or she can just switch with me and I'm equally happy with either one. I have to admit most of the time it's, do you want Italian, you know, or Mexican? I don't care. Do you want to go to this restaurant? I don't care. When I get to my third, I don't care. I usually just find something in front of me um, that, you know, my partner put in front of me. And I've already, by the way, said three times I'm not hungry. <laughs> right? Three times I'm not hungry. And because I'm probably starving, but I don't want to just, I don't want to deal with this anymore. This is just food. It shouldn't be that hard. And food goes in front of me and I will literally just start like just devouring it. Um, and that is how a simple, a simple decision, a simple choice can, can just consume you. Mm -hmm. And it was a frustrating mm -hmm. part of our relationship for a really long time until my two supporters figured it out. And it's like, wow, this is just, it's debilitating in a way, but it also affects those relationships because they think we're not engaged. We don't care. Um, and that's hard. That's, that's hard when they think we're not engaged because it's something we just don't have the energy to do. But it helped us understand after we talked. Right. Of, oh, oh, you're just tired. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we get this? Yeah. yeah we do really well with choices over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was sarcasm, by the way. No, um, it's not. Well, we do. <laughs> okay, well, well. Whoa, right, hold on. <laughs> If you give me a choice between A and B, I'll pick one. Okay, that's true. <laughs> Sometimes, again, making the choices is, is a challenge coming up. And, you know, one, one thing, one thing um, it's important, I, I'd love to talk about with you guys too as well, is it's really important for me to meet 
Heather halfway with helping out with different things around the house because what, what I find is there's times when I'm not going to be able to do as much as I want to. So finding out what I can do to support her. Um, I do have designated responsibilities in the house. She gets ice water before bed every single night. Like that's something I have to do. Um, but, you know, finding out what are the, some of those things that I can do to help because it's, you know, it's so easy to, to be focused and be stuck in my sleepy head all the time and not realize, okay, I need to step outside of that. We've got three kids um, who, you know, a little bit older now and they, they can help out a little bit too, but like making sure that that burden doesn't shift entirely onto her. Or if it does, that it's only temporary and then I'm stepping back in when I can, because it's, um, it, it's a lot of extra work for her. You know, if I'm having a, a flare, if I'm having a bad, um, you know, symptom severity um, day. So, you know, I, I'd love to hear just from both your perspectives and, and um, I've already heard Heather's perspective, but I'd love to hear it too publicly, uh, just about <laughs> how that works with, within your relationships. For me, I try to do, um, I'm, on, I'm on disability, so I'm home during the day. And, uh, you know, Jen's out working all day. So I try to do what I can when I can. Again, you know, it's some days it's nothing. Sometimes I've got the laundry and the washer. Sometimes I can get the whole task done. I try to do what I can when I can. Um, that's kind of how we work it. And she kind of knows when she needs to, you know, to pick up. So we just have that understanding when I've got that look, when I've got that, you know, she does as much as she can. Um, when she's, you know, bogged down at work and I can do it, I do as much as I can. But there's just that understanding that it, it didn't get done. It wasn't because I just didn't want to do it. Um, it's just hard. I also ask for the dots to be put very close together. If she's going to tell me, listen, I need this, I need this, I need this. Um, and the third thing she gave me was the most important. You know, I'm going to assume the first thing she gave me was the most important because that's how my mind works. So I need that open communication of just be very clear. You know, what do you really need me to do? What is a, you know, what's a must have, what's a nice to have, what's a, I would be jumping over the moon if you actually did this, you know. So I, I guess for us, it's, uh, we, we try to, when she wants to try and do things, I try and make sure that she has the space to do them. I think the big thing that she stresses with me is just like, there are certain things that I wanna do and it might take me longer, but I don't want you to touch them. Like, just let me do it. Um, and making sure that I give her the space to do what she wants to do when she wants to, um, so that she can have things done the way that she'd like. Um, but then also like, what's what's nice is we, we have with with dinner, <laughs> We have this system where um, I tend to cook the meals, but then she has this wonderful wizardry where like if I'm messing with some with the seasoning and she doesn't get it or it, and it, it's not quite right, she can fix it. Like she just can smell it and she somehow comes up with, oh, you need this and this, oh, fixed. Um, and then we also have an agreement where if I'm overwhelmed, she then helps pick, okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll get takeout from here instead. Mm -hmm. That was going to be a point that I made. Some of those things that we are able to and have the privilege to put off to other people um, or to other services, we those are definitely things that we take advantage of. Um, lawn care was a big one for us. And finally, hiring a lawn guy who comes every two weeks means that neither of us have to put our energy toward that and we can put it toward other things that are more important. Yeah. Um, again, that's a very privileged thing to be able to do, yeah, yeah. but it is something that I'm incredibly grateful that we have. Um, mm -hmm. But just reiterating that communication between us is going to be the key. Yeah. yeah. Um, being able to communicate where each of us are at at any given moment. And flexibility. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we try to have like grab and go meals, something yes. quick, something you can just throw together, um, you know, because I could have had that plan. I was going to make something for dinner and mm -hmm. it got to it. And, you know, neither one of us had the energy to do it. So mm -hmm. just be flexible and move on and pivot. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like flexibility is a big deal. Communication is like mm -hmm. always the thing that really matters the most is communicating as much as possible and being proactive about that and understanding each other's needs as best as possible. Yeah. yeah. 
I would also say grace, extending oh, grace when, I was thinking um, that's what I was gonna because say. it's not like we're, it's, we're up here, we're talking about how communication and it makes it sound like we don't um, mess up or have friction and fights. And I mean, the reality is like there's headbutts that happen throughout the week and it's, it's with love because we're trying to accomplish something as a family, you know, to, to get across the finish line to make sure the grass doesn't get two feet high before we try to cut it or make sure the dishes don't fill up. Um, we have three sinks upstairs and they fill up so fast. Well, I'll tell you that story later, but you know, figuring out like, again, giving each other grace, like the dishes will be there tomorrow. You know, if we can get to them tonight, let's go ahead and take care of them. You know, if I have done something, you know, more work related and then I didn't get a chance to do pick up something around the house, like trying to figure out, you know, how I can make up for it in, a, in another way. Um, you know, and then Heather's pretty good about being like, you know, it's okay. We can, again, the communication piece, saying why something didn't get done, but re resetting some expectations and prioritizing what's, what, what are we going to do next to make this right, to get out from behind that, uh, right. that snowball. Yeah, grace, grace is like mm -hmm. really, really important part because we have to, we, we really do have to give each other grace because um, sometimes like I, I have a, I have ADHD and so it's very easy for me to go start a project and then walk away and then go start another project and then go walk away and then start another project and go walk away and oh but there was this other thing that I needed to do um, and so I know that my, my my wife is very tolerant of my many projects that I will totally get back to. Yeah, See I do that I start the project and I get tired and I don't finish it. You know, and I start another project because that one is boring now. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, mm. so it's a, uh, and I just, I'm sitting here thinking though, it's like, that's going for every relationship. It's, you know, the thing I started with my, you know, I was going to go do this with a friend and, you know, you have to find that, that grace with mm -hmm. you know, myself if I can't make it and ask them to understand it too. You said, you know, that you said dating and I can't, you know, I couldn't imagine. I, I did date through my actual diagnosis um, and it's difficult. It's difficult. It is, and you know, at the risk of saying communication 400 times in a single session, I, right. I think that's, that's the thing too, <laughs> when you're looking to find, you know, a potential partner or someone, even, even when it comes to friends, like setting the expectation of this is what I can offer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and again, if I can't do this, it's not because I don't want to do something with you. Um, you know, I've got what I would consider, you know, 200 friends in the sleep community. Um, and I always say, if you reach out to me, I will get back to you. It may not be next day, right. but I will do my best to get back to you because they know I've got you know, three kids at home. I've got a partner that I have to, um, you know, we've got to work together to make, make this household work. We've got jobs to do, but always, you know, again, set that expectation out when, when I'm passing out my contact information, yeah. happy to help you, yes. but uh, you may not get help tomorrow. So if it's an emergency, you may want to call right. someone who can help with an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'm not going to help you move. I don't want to do that. So mm -hmm. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Were you diagnosed when you started dating? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. So, I mean, it was, um, so did you tell her right off the bat? Did you No, That's a great question. I, I, I put down some of my volunteer work as like a little breadcrumb. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I wrote down that I was doing some blog writing. Um, and you know, I, I think I referenced a chronic illness early on. Um, and you know, she didn't run. Uh, well, she, no, she didn't run. She was a mental health provider was in, was in her, um, was in her, you know, her bio. And I was like, okay, this might work. Um, and then, right. And then she right. asked, and then I, I, she was like, can you share one of your, your blogs? And I, and I did, and she was reading it while I was on the phone. And I was like, she goes, wait, you have narcolepsy with cataplexy. And I was like, no, she's going to hang up. This is, this was great yeah. while it lasted, but right. no, right. no. And, and no, what actually came out of my mouth was you were the first person I've talked to who has the same diagnosis as my sister. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, okay. See, I was, the first I didn't know what was wrong that. with me, mm -hmm. you know, when we were dating, I had no idea. It would, and it mm -hmm. was just getting worse and worse. And, um, so I went through the diagnosis pro, you know, process and I, I kind of figured it would, there was going to be a breakup, but cause it's hard, you know, how do I communicate that? And mm -hmm. how do I keep telling this person? I I'm, I'm too sleepy. Um, I'd like to be in bed by eight, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah challenges on both ends mm -hmm. yeah like like you um i think 
my wife was not, um, she wasn't diagnosed when I first started to date her. Um, but I saw kind of a steady progression and just, we, we decided, okay, well maybe, maybe something's up. Maybe you should investigate. And she did. And it, I, to me, I was lucky because I got to see the progression. And so I got to see the whole picture and really understand it a lot more. Um, just because I saw her before her IH was really, really bad. And so I could understand like, it was crystal clear that this was, that this was the IH. Yeah, it's it's great that you know you two also had somebody that kind of kind of love you through that that process and and then there's probably no two stories that are exactly the same but you know what one thing too i would encourage if anybody's looking for a partner is fine, do make sure you're investing time with someone who actually is willing to, to kind of walk this journey with you because you know the relationships are hard there's such a, um, a time and energy commitment and you know if, if you're fine if you're not with somebody who can reciprocate or, or help balance that's, that's such a challenging thing and you know having been with somebody who saw that progression kind of as it happened and then walked away that was tough it was tough to be vulnerable again in a relationship and to open up and to you know be like okay I, well, let's try and do this again because and then again don't want to say don't give up till the miracle happens and and um sometimes that's what what dating's like you know you you, you got to keep something you have to keep trying and in relationships too not just romantic relationships but mm -hmm. find people who will invest in you um and, and be willing yeah. to stick yeah. through because otherwise um you know they can't be the giving tree all the time i've lost some friends because you know mm -hmm. i haven't made enough you know and no matter how many times i try to explain it um, and I think they might understand it. It's a week later, like, oh, you're still sick? Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Mm. Yes, I'm. I'm yeah. not getting better. That's what a chronic. Means. You know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> like... and that's when I realized that's not my person. You know, that's mm -hmm. not going to be my friend. Mm -hmm. um, I say I have like a, an onion of relationships. You know, mm -hmm. as I peel back, I decide which ones are going to get, you know, the biggest part of me, you know, the honest, this is what I have. And, if I see that this relationship with this friend is not really going to work, I'm not going to invest. This is who I am. This is what I have to have. And I'm sorry if I do this. I just, you have to assess those relationships. And, and it, that goes for family too, mm -hmm. you know, you know, siblings as well. You know, they don't understand it. Like, you know, what do you mean you're still sick? Yeah. yeah. I love you, but I don't want to spend time with you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that's, that's, that's a yeah. family of, of origin stuff. Yeah. I have to say some of my, you know, my support villages, people that I've met in these rooms, mm -hmm. you know, certainly. Yeah. And speaking of the folks in the room, do we want to open the floor to some questions? Yeah, certainly. That was a really good segue I did. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> so when you talk about progression, does it get worse? It changes. Um, at least for, so for my wife and I, I think her symptoms did get worse. Um, initially, they were, they were, um, they were, I guess, more mild um, in that she could take, um, she could take some medication and feel much better and be able to work a job and um, function fairly well. But because of some issues that she had with some medications. Um, she wasn't able to take certain classes of the medications that are available, which kind of cut what options she had down significantly to the point where um, there were, wasn't much left. And then she had other pieces of chronic illness kind of pop up and that impacted, um, that impacted her life as a whole. Um, so you do sometimes see um, IH get worse over time. It does vary. I've known a couple people to be very lucky and have symptoms get better. Um, and we celebrate when that happens. Um, For me, I think, um, I don't know. I think I just faked it a lot better and struggled through and I could push mm -hmm. through for a while. And then... Um, and oddly enough, I'd say the same thing. I had a, a couple other 
um, health things pop up that, uh, you know, kind of affected it. And, uh, but it did get to the point where, you know, it got a little worse, but then there's times where I had medicine that did, you know, give me a little bit of quality of life back. Uh, you know, I guess brain fog has developed a little bit more for me over the years um, and become very um, interfering with my cognitive ability. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think it ebbs and flows at times. It never, I don't know, I don't know that I know what normal is anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that this is not it. <laughs> I, I think the answer to that is it depends. Yeah. You know, it mm -hmm. depends yeah. on the person. Um, you know, Dr. Trotty identified some, um, you know, basically remission, you know, examples that, that you could point to. It also depends on whether or not you're talking about NT1 or IH. Right. Situationally, um, you know, life events happen, things get worse, but that's that happens with the general population as well. No one's ever going to stay on a completely even performance yeah. level. I believe Matilda has a question. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, how do you deal with already being at, say, an event or um, like the cinema and you're with a group of friends and you need to leave or you need to take a nap? Um, do you just like ask your partner or do you send a text? Yeah, I think that there's some nonverbal. Yeah. Um, and then also mm -hmm. in certain situations, like I will look at Heather and go, I'm done. And, and then I just go and excuse myself. And she'll also sometimes look at me and right. if I'm not making any sense and be like, why don't you go lay down, sweetie? Um, and yeah. That's, that's helpful. I think it's the same. Like sometimes I used to fight it though. You know, you really should like go back to the room. Yeah, no. If somebody's usually saying that, it usually means I need it. Um, but nonverbals, I discreetly just, you know, so it's not a big deal. A text message would be helpful too. Like if, if you don't want to say it out loud, and mm -hmm. especially to out yourself in a, in a public setting, you know, you know, hey, I, I got to go. Peace out. I'm going to go to the restroom and not come back for 30 minutes, whatever, whatever however you want to put it. There are also situations where he and I will take two different vehicles, depending on what we're doing. If mm -hmm. it's something where we know that I may want to stay longer, then he may have the ability to stay so that when it is time for him to go, he's able to do so without it infringing upon my ability to be there um but also i tend toward the introverted so most of the time when he's ready to go so am i <laughs> <laughs> i've been diagnosed with ih for 20 years um and i'm just now realizing some things that maybe are related to ih that i'm not even thinking about like um i have felt like i'm needy my entire life like i'm just needy um, and have y'all felt that way before? Is this something that, <laughs> that is part of the stigma that we put on ourselves maybe? Um, but I think some of these things, it's, I'm just think. I mean, I have a wonderful supporter here. Um, but I, I have, I feel guilty when I ask things and, you know, when we were first married, it was just, he was going to take care of me and that, you know, that, that kind of thing. But um, anyway, that's, I'm just wondering about that. I think having a need doesn't mean you're needy too. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be mm -hmm. something I would probably put on repeat. I also have these messages that replay in my head. Sometimes it's my voice. Sometimes it's the voice of people who, you know, told me to get my butt moving and pull myself up by my bootstraps. That's not a healthy message. And, and one thing I did want to talk about a little bit too, talking with a, a with a therapist one on one, a couples counselor. That's so helpful in terms of helping to to bridge healthy communication. Um, so I mean, if that's something your partner is willing to do, like that's a, a great way. You have to find the right person, and it's a challenge because not all therapists understand the challenges of living with a hypersomnolence disorder. So it right. may involve some education, you teaching them. Um, a little bit about what your experience is like as well. Yeah, there's nothing better than paying a therapist to tell us we get to say no. Um, and, but you know, it's, I still went home and went, ah, wow, I get, I get to say no. It's RSVP, I get to say no. Um, but I guess I have a description for that. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think that there, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of times where my my wife has expressed that she feels guilty about needing more. And I think generally, like, you'd be surprised what maybe your supporter thinks of as like, maybe that wasn't, that didn't feel as much like more to them than it did to you. 
Uh, I think a lot of the conversations we sometimes have is she'll express some guilt about something. Like, I really wanted to go to this. I'm really sorry that 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 I wasn't able to go. And, and, and I'll look at her and say, it's fine. I can just read my book that I wanted to read. Like, that's fine. Like, it's not a big deal. Or, oh, well, we'll just play, we'll just play a game together. Or, oh, like, we'll just watch a show together. Like, to me, I get to spend time with her in it. Mm-hmm regardless of whether I'm going somewhere or whether I'm at home enjoying a different activity with her. Like it's a lot of times it's worth trying to understand if it's you who's assigning the weight to that, or if it's, if you're seeing that in your, in your supporter. We are tough on ourselves. You know, like Mm -hmm. I said, and that anxiety kicks in and then it kind of just starts snowballing because, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't, we don't want to not do it, you know. Yeah. Yep. All right. It looks like we are at time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.